Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series uh, where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Um, we broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, as we are doing right now, and then it is posted onto our website in our archives for you um, people to watch at their convenience. Uh, both the live show and the archive recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics of our shows. Um, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska and it's for all types of libraries. So we have um, things that run the gamut on our show. We, um, we have things for publics, K-12, um, academics and uni universities and colleges, uh, corrections facilities, uh, museums, archives. Um, basically our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Um, at all types of libraries. So something libraries are doing, something they think they could be doing, um, interesting or new resources or services that are out there. So um, we have a whole um, bunch of different things here. Sometimes we do book reviews or the demos and mini training sessions of things, interviews with people, um, all sorts of things on the show. Um, we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff sometimes do sessions um, on the show for things that we are offering here via the Nebraska Library Commission, but we also bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have today. Um, on the line with us is, um, and there, there are also here, we're, the Library Commission is based here in Lincoln, and they're all in, you're all in Lincoln as well, correct? But just, Oh, and current. <laughs> in other offices. So we're all coming in here remotely on cameras from different places in, in the city. <laughs> um, we have um, Holly Hatton Bowers is on there. Hi, Holly. Hi. And then also Amy Napoli and Linda Reddish are doing Good together. Good morning. And they are all from our Nebraska Extensions um, at yeah, UNL, University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, and I'm just going to hand over to you guys. They're going to talk to us about this awesome, this great program that I'm, I'm very excited about that they have, this Read for Resilience for Children. Um, and I'm just going to hand it over to you guys to um, explain who you are, what you do there, and all about this new this program you started up. Great. Thanks so much for having us. Um, as Krista said, I'm Amy Napoli. I'm an assistant professor of child, youth, and family studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and also uh, an early childhood specialist with Nebraska Extension. Hi, good morning. My name is Linda Reddish. Um, I'm a statewide educator uh, with Nebraska Extension, and so uh, my focus is mostly children, families, and then also early childhood. Hi, good morning. I'm Holly Hatton Bowers, and I'm an assistant professor um, in child, youth, and family studies, and also uh, an early childhood extension specialist. And my um, I guess my passion is really early childhood and promoting emotional well-being of caregivers and young children. So we're really excited to share this great project that we started, um, I guess, back in the spring. So it's great to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, so today, Linda is just going to introduce our learning child team. Um, um, and we'll talk a little bit about Nebraska Extension's response to the flooding. And then um, Holly and I will talk about the background of Read for Resilience um, and what the project is and how you can get involved if you're interested. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> University of Nebraska-Lincoln has Nebraska Extension. Uh, Nebraska Extension sort of always been known as sort of the um, outreach arm of the university. And so Extension's role as part of a land grant based university is to connect in all of our uh, counties throughout the state and provide whether that's research, education or community programs. Um, we try to think about that as what can we do for the good of the public and uh, our particular focus as the learning child team then is to support children, families, and then early childhood professionals. And when I say early childhood professionals, I'm meaning um, child care providers, family home providers, really any adult who's working with young children. And that, of course, includes parents, right, because they're their kids' first teachers. So our team of extension educators across the state um, work closely with the extension specialists. So as Holly 
and Amy just mentioned. Both of them have uh, appointments here at the university, but they work closely with extension educators like myself to share their um, expertise and knowledge. And then we uh, go out and deliver a lot of that programming in the state in a, in a very collaborative way. And so we really are, as I mentioned, you know, um, doing our best to provide affordable research-based education, educational programs for resources. And again, this is offered throughout the state of Nebraska. And so really what our goal is, is to, to empower, as I mentioned earlier, any adult who's caring for young children to have access and um, have the opportunity to be provided high quality professional development. And that's because uh, we hope that in doing so, that will set the stage for lifelong uh, learning, discovery and success of children. So what we're gonna talk about a little bit today is the Read for Resiliency program. But before we jump right into that, we wanted to provide some context behind the history that led us to developing this program. So as we mentioned, our goal is really to support communities uh, throughout Nebraska. And uh, earlier this spring, Nebraska was impacted uh, by several natural disasters, including the bomb cyclone and flooding. And so in response to the flooding and the natural disasters that have um, occurred in Nebraska this year, uh, we identified that uh, children and families would likely be experiencing uh, some stress following uh, these natural disasters. And so we really wanted to focus on how could we then support and help young children cope? Um, and what are the uh, different ways that parents or educators could play a role in supporting uh, children and youth um, experiencing the emotions that they're having, but then finding a path towards healing? And so our first response actually was to develop a website, which was this disaster website. And so we created the website so that Extension could, uh, you know, uh, start to have a platform for what and how uh, you could initially start immediately following the flooding. And so we we formulated our website around sort of three key areas in the immediate response that we noticed folks were having. So one was family stress. Um, and so we know that everyone um, experienced stress at some point in your life, but ongoing chronic stress and then stress related particularly um, to natural disasters uh, can compromise your health and well being. And so this subpage has uh, several resources um, that we have, including a list of common signs of chronic stress. And uh, individuals then can look at that and say, oh, um, I'm noticing someone that I know is experiencing these symptoms and signs of chronic stress. And then we have a list of resources and hotlines that, that you can refer someone to. The resources are both national and Nebraska specific. So we would encourage you to check those out. Again, the goal in making this site was to identify resources that immediately could get into the hands of those caring for young children. Then the next part, as we mentioned, our team also supports early childhood professionals. So early childhood professionals have a really unique role in planning what to do before, during, and after uh, an emergency event or a natural disaster. And so this website has resources specific to emergency preparedness and educators' roles in supporting young children during um, emergencies. So really interesting kind of note. Uh, we know that uh, nearly 80% of young children uh, from birth to age five, according to the Buffett Early Childhood Institute, are in some form of paid care today. And so it was really critical then that we identified these resources for child care programs and after school program kids, knowing that young children are often in these settings for a good chunk of their day. And so then finally, we wanted to talk about helping children cope. And we'll, we'll shift the majority of our conversation around really this particular topic. So as we mentioned, we, we wanted to identify and promote ways that children could be supported in response to a natural disaster and the stress that they might be feeling. And knowing that they were having stress, that would then lead to them experiencing a variety of different emotions and that it was really important to remember that all adults play a really important role in helping young children find ways to experience, manage, and then cope with the emotions that they are experiencing. 
And so on this link, we have several resources um, from birth through age 18 um, that are available so that if you're interested in what are some of the um, you know, immediate strategies that I could start to implement, or maybe I'm not 100% um, aware of what I should be looking for, or what are some common signs or symptoms, that, that is all available on this particular subpage. Um, and so as we thought about right, helping children to cope, this led us then to saying, okay, now how do, how do we find ways to help young children emotionally cope? And in particular, um, you know, the, the effectiveness of different strategies. And that's how we landed now on Read for Resilience. So Dr. Holly Huttenbowers is gonna talk a little bit here about how you can use children's literature to help young children um, heal and kind of think about emotional development in the context of a natural disaster. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, so I think, <clears throat> as Linda said, she gave a great, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting over a cough, um, a great description of how children and their caregivers, so either a parent um, or even a child care provider, um, can be a source of support to help children during um, a natural disaster, which can be very stressful, um, and it also can be possibly traumatic, right? So if you think of a child who may be displaced or have to move from their home because it's flooded, um, they don't have their familiar items with them, right? And so we wanted to come up with a way, there, there I will say um, our website is an amazing resource for understanding how children will respond in different ways um, to these types of natural disasters and events. Um, but it's also, I want to also say that Sesame Street has some great resources as well in terms of how to talk to children about even, and they're and really specific to natural disasters. So I just want to share that as a resource. So what we wanted to do was not duplicate efforts with some resources that were out there, but create a unique opportunity to really understand, to provide a support to caregivers um, in terms of how can you help children have some more emotional understanding and learn some strategies that may help them cope with whatever, with whatever their experience may be. And so this slide is purposely put here to show you that a child may experience the same event. So maybe it's they can't return to their child care provider um, because they need to have their home cleaned out. And so you can think about how that might create stress for the family, how that might put stress on the child if they're used, right? The young children in particular really like predictability. Um, and so taking away that safety and that predictability can feel kind of scary. So you can see here a child may respond in different ways. So they might want to have a need of physically covering up to feel safe because they're worried and scared. So that particular child feels worried and scared because they don't have their um, the, the child care provider that they used to be with. And they're experiencing kind of that stress of the climate of the home as well. So that child may say, I need to build a fort. <laughs> That's my need right now because I have worry and I scared. Um, another child may feel feelings of angry, right? Just as adults, we experience events, maybe similar events, but we respond in different ways. And so this child is saying, I really want to hit a pillow and roar like a dinosaur, right? That's going to be their strategy to kind of release that anger. Um, for another child, it might be feeling really overwhelmed. And so you might help them with a counting exercise. Um, and then another child may feel sad and really need that physical comfort. So this is to illustrate um, we put this here because this is how we're thinking about the books that we're going to go into more detail about later, Amy will talk, talk about, um, is that we knew that children would be responding to these events with different reactions and different feelings. Um, and so having books really help them have more under understanding emotionally of what could be going on through the characters. So now I'm going to move to the next slide. That's okay. So right here is Read for Resilience um, and really supporting young children's coping with story books. So research shows that children's literature in an interactive way, so that means that I'm not simply picking up the book and reading it, which has a lot of great um, benefits as well, but I'm going to actually pick up the book and I'm going to say, we're going to talk today about a terrible thing that happened. And I'm going to go through and set it up in terms of what may be happening through the story. I might even flip through and show the pictures to the children before I start reading um, the actual words, if it has words in the book. And I might even flip over to the back and the front, right? So I'm really getting them engaged in the book. I'm showing them, kind of setting it up on what we're going to learn about and talk about. So I start getting you kind of primed 
to this is a story about someone who's worried. And so we're going to think about that, right? We're going to think about our feelings around being worried and looking at some of the strategies that are used. So that's how this is a storybook activity and how we um, will share more about how we um, scaffold that. So before we do that, we thought, and I don't know if there's a lot of attendees, so we can even open it up if you want to um, and just share and think about your own experiences with reading. So we have some questions that we came up with. What are some reading experiences you have had that influence how you interact in the world? And you can put that in the chat or if you want to raise your hand, just hear some responses. Yeah, yeah, just you should be able to go ahead and just type into the question section of your interface. Or if you want to use your microphone, if you have one available that's working, um, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you. So this would be experiences like them personally, not necessarily yeah, with, yeah, with your own personal experience. Yeah. Yep. And another question is, what are ways that reading stories has impacted your learning and the way you understand feelings? And how did early storybook reading impact your desire to read books today? And do you have any favorites growing up as a child? So really, we just want to think about your own personal experience with how you use books to how it may have influenced your understanding of feelings. And, in coping. So if people are typing, unfortunately I can't see like, you know, sometimes when you're texting or, or chatting with someone, you can see they're working on something. I'm not sure until they finish typing in. So, <laughs> so please, so someone go ahead and share with, about any of these questions. Um, <clears throat> I can say, I, I don't, for myself, I don't know. I was trying to think about the first two questions there. Um, reading that have influenced how I interact in the world. I don't know if I remember anything specifically, but maybe subconsciously or th those kind of situations that were I was put into as a child with like, we're gonna talk about this and this is the book we're gonna read. And then you don't always necessarily remember that specific event. Mm -hmm. um, because I mean, I've been reading since I was a kid, since I was as long as we can, as soon as we could walk, my dad was taking us to the public library every Saturday. I remember that. <laughs> so we were always attending things there. Um, and it could be, as, I, I was just thinking like my, Anne of Green Gables was a huge influence. Mm -hmm. My dad bought me the books and so we read it together because <laughs> um, he knew I was really fascinated with it. And so asking questions and just thinking about being resilient in different ways and um kind of putting yourself out there to develop you know like being resilient what does that mean and doing things that are really you're passionate about right in terms of your professional motivation so it could be just kind of you think about books might help you with a character that you relate to and might have influenced your thinking i don't know linda and amy if you have any the first thing that i thought about with this was the velveteen rabbit and how like when i read it like just feelings of empathy um and kind of the emotions that are tied to that book and all of the very strong emotions that I felt as a child. And how I always thought about that in relating to um, other people in the world and even inanimate objects, <laughs> things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think some of the way reading stories has impacted my learning and the way that I learned to understand feelings has really been shown now as a parent. And so now when I read books and I read stories, it's impacted the way that I even think about how children process emotions. So for example, um, when we would read My Many Colored Days and we would talk about how different colors and how I would feel on different days. And you know, when I'm pink, I just can't think, you know, it makes me so happy. Um, and so that's shifted then to how I, I think about um, understanding feelings and, and also how kids like, a color can spark an emotion for a child or a picture can spark an emotion for a child. Um, and in what ways then do I as an adult take in information and how does that impact how then I understand my own feelings? Mm -hmm. And your child's feelings? Yeah, my child's feelings. As far as the the, the third question, though, the, the, the um, storybook impacting your desire to read books and any favorites, um, <sighs> My most, my ones I remember most are ones that when I was older, I guess. I mean, I have lots of, 
ones that stick in my mind are things like um, Watership Down um, and Chronicles of Narnia when I was reading when I was like a teenager or middle school. Um, there was a, the, the Watership Down is my favorite book, I think. And I always remember the, the ending of that. And I think because I hope people all read it, death at the end of it. Um, and it was something that I always go back to when I'm thinking about that, that it, that, you know, how to deal with if someone has passed away, that it's okay, that they're, it's not the end of everything. It's still a different kind of, you know, other things will go on. That's something that I always think about from that book. Thanks for sharing that. I'm mad that went to my list. <laughs> it's for well, older, not, like, not, you know, it's not a kid's book, but it does have, yeah, I always think about that part of it. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me cry every time I read it. You know, I reread it all the time, watching the old movie, the new TV show that was on. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a good thing to deal with the feelings about it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that really helps us sort of think about transitioning then a little bit, right? Because we're talking about how do you pause and think about your experience? And then your example talks about how you can use storybook then to cope with your feelings, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, if nobody yeah so any. books can be a great way to just have some understanding, especially if you go to the next slide, Amy. I don't see any other comments but anyway just some some things to think about right like how we as adults also use books sometimes um even in fictional stories to think about maybe how we're feeling and um ways that we might also have strategies as well so that's really what we were doing um what we are doing with read for resilience so this is a great article um i could even share the link to it um it just came out kozak and i don't know really i don't know how to say the last person but Ritipia, 2019 um, has a great overview about how, how storybooks can offer experiences for children to learn and think about and reflect on the events and their feelings. And so a lot of this research has been done with K through 12, um, but there's even research starting to become more, um, it's, there's becoming more research in the pre-K. So even in preschoolers, and we know with babies too, right? It's a great way to just start even you as an adult and a caregiver to um, relate to children and use language around um, emotions. So that really develops that understanding. And then it can really help children to think about, oh, if this character, so this is the idea of, of identification, right? Um, of I'm, I'm identifying with this character and maybe their situation, and I can see how they might have used some different ways of coping, which might be that I'm gonna reach out to my parent and I'm gonna share that I'm sad, or maybe I'm gonna use a stuffy and I'm going to hold that stuffy um, as a comfort item, just as, as the character did in the book. So the books that we chose, I share this because we were really intentional in choosing books that would have this element of um, catharsis. So that story character is dealing with situations and the students are learning about empathy towards um, whatever the situation may be in the characters. And then they can experience the process through the book. So if you know that children um, during a natural disaster are you know, scared or they might have feelings of separation, then you can think about a book that may help with that. So when we chose our books, we were really thinking about how are these elements of involvement, identifying, having that process um, of the catharsis, the insight, so thinking about the difficult events and then how they were responding to it. And then this idea of universalization, which is that I'm not alone, and these are experiences that other characters and other people may be experiencing. So our books were really chosen around age appropriately around these ideas to have these elements. Um, and we're continuing to, to add to them too, so in some other ways, so that we might have children who are angry, we might have some that are worried, we might have some children who are sad, and so the books hopefully touch on these different feelings and thoughts um, to help them learn strategies for coping. So after selecting the book, um, it can be really helpful to extend learning with questions and activities. And that's really where the storybook reading guides come in. And Amy's gonna talk more about um, how we develop those and what they look like. And then there's some great activities you can see where um, Linda did an activity with children and it's, it's really great to see how they were processing their feelings after reading the book. Thanks. 
Um, so currently the Read for Resilience um, program is housed online. Um, we have nine storybooks that we've selected um, and then two more that are in progress and we're working all the time to identify more um, and develop additional um, storybooks and storybook guides to go with them. Um, so these nine storybooks that we've selected, um, as Holly said, they're kind of um, intentional, not kind of, they are intentional, we've intentionally selected them um, to be kind of general um, around themes of resilience, coping, um, and kind of involving children in identifying and exploring their emotions. So three examples of the books that we have um, for the program are up there. Um, they're uh, designed to be kind of for a broad range of maturity for children's ages, um, experiences, and kind of where they are. Um, so the way I feel is kind of an example of a more basic one for younger children, just working on identifying their emotions, um, naming them, um, and learning different ways to talk about them. Um, and then the other example, a terrible thing happened um, that's up there is kind of um, more specific to something that happened and um, engaging maybe older and more mature children and talking about um, that experience that they had. Um, so currently the books are um, available for free um, for caregivers who have children in Nebraska that were affected by the natural disasters this year. Um, and so caregivers, that means parents or child care providers. Um, we've also had some school psychologists sign up for the program, which is awesome because we know that means that the program is getting out to more children. Um, but you can go online to our website um, and if you meet these criteria as a caregiver in Nebraska um, of a child who's affected by the flooding or blizzards, um, you can apply to select five of the books that um, will be mailed to you at no cost. Um, but the storybook guides that we've developed to go along with the books are available online for anybody. So anybody can go on the website, which we'll share later, um, how to access, excuse me, the website. Anyone can go on there and access the storybook guides. So if these are books that are available to you in your library um, to check out, then you can also access them that way um, if you're not in Nebraska um, or weren't affected. And we yeah, selected- right. you know the, the flooding that was in, of many states around us. <laughs> yes, um, and we, we've been partnering with um, some folks in South Dakota. Um, we've had interest from Iowa also. Um, so there, there are people in those states um, and other states around us um, that um, that we can give information to you if you're not in Nebraska about accessing the resources um, mm -hmm. at no cost. Um, but like I said, libraries are always a great place to go see if your librarian has these books um, and then you can use the storybook guides to go along with them. So this is an example of one of the storybook guides. Um, we have one um, available for all nine of the books that we have and um, as Holly and I mentioned, we're working um, to develop more of them. Um, two are in progress right now. Um, so all of the storybook guides have questions or prompts that go along with a specific story. Um, so this is an example of the one from um, it, the way I feel. Um, so kind of talking about the emotions um, and exploring them more. And then they also have suggested activities to go along with them. Um, so the next um, piece is an example of one of the activities. Um, so these guides are available as trifolds. You can download, print them. Um, they'll be available in some of the libraries soon. Um, um, or you can look at them like on an iPad or tablet to go along. Um, so this particular activity um, in this book, A Terrible Thing Happened, um, one of the ways that the adult is helping the child Sherman um, cope with his experience is by drawing um, his feelings and talking about his anger and fear that he has. Um, so as Holly mentioned, Linda um, brought this activity to some uh, children in her area and this is an example of one of the illustrations, one of the pictures that a child drew. Um, and the child said, these are all of my feelings. I filled the whole paper with my feelings. The next one, um, I love this example because the child um, provides a specific strategy that they use. So this is a picture of me looking at elephants at the zoo. They're big and sometimes they're scary and I hold my mom's hand and then I feel better. So this is a great opportunity um, to elaborate with children on different coping mechanisms, different strategies that they can use. Um, and the same with the next one, um, which I love because it's kind of a silly example. You never know what you get when you're working with children. Um, so this is me feeling sad um, because the bananas are 
were laughing at me and I feel sad when bananas laugh at me and it makes me feel like throwing things. Um, so this is an opportunity to talk about different strategies of, oh, when you feel sad or angry, you might want to throw things. What are some other ways that we can think about processing our feelings? What are other things that we can do when, when we feel sad or angry? Um, and but the story book- that a banana is laughing, that's a, that's a problem of its own. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I wish I was there. Working with children is the best because, like I said, you never know what is going to come up or what you get. Um, but even these kind of um, strange or silly situations that pop up are good opportunities to talk about strategies um, and ways to promote resilience. Um, and all of the storybook guides have different activities. Some of them are mindfulness activities um, to practice breathing exercises um, as a way of coping. Um, one of the ones Holly pointed out earlier was about counting. Um, and you could count your breaths, things like that. So different different strategies um, are available in the um, act, the storybook guides um, to kind of go with the different things that children feel and the different ways that they have of coping. So the next um, step for the Read for Resilience project is bringing this program to the library. So we have these books that are available that caregivers can apply for. Um, but we're also expanding to make it something that um, caregivers can attend with their children and we could kind of talk more about these ideas. Um, so we're partnering currently with local libraries um, and we're working all the time to get this brought throughout the state um, so it can, these programs can be available to the children who are really impacted by the flooding. Um, so the design of the program is that caregivers bring their children in um, caregivers observe a read aloud with the children, um, kind of learn some strategies um, for reading, asking questions, engaging children, um, and then also a piece about learning about social emotional development. So children, um, we know, experience all of the things that adults experience, but they might not have the strategies or the tools to talk about their feelings the same way that we do um, or to explain why they're doing something that they're doing. So. Um, this piece really focuses on helping adults understand children's emotions um, and different ways that they may cope. Um, after observing the storybook reading, um, caregivers go learn about that piece and then children participate in activities to promote their resilience um, or talk about feelings, things like that. So one example is making worry stones with children, kind of talking about how that can be a good strategy um, for working through their emotions. And um, that picture um, you can see is one of the displays that will be going up in, at the local libraries. Um, we're working to partner with librarians throughout the state so that this is something that can be available in all of the libraries. Um, so the books that we've identified um, will be available to check out in our local Lincoln libraries. Um, and if there are librarians listening, um, please reach out. Can, yeah, I was going to say, um, if it had been, an, I'd seen that um, just recently, they probably saw we were doing the show, that um, Lincoln City Libraries had shared um, about the program. Mm -hmm. So they have this yes. in, their, in some of their um, locations already? So November 2nd, we'll be piloting our first program um, <laughs> with, with the libraries in Lincoln. Um, and then around that time, also these displays will be available in the, the nine, nine libraries throughout our area. Um, so they will have um, each of the books available to check out information on how um, caregivers can also access them um, if they want to receive copies of the library of the books and then the storybook guides will be printed and available um, when the books are checked out. Um, but as I mentioned, they're, they're always available online as well. So anyone can access those too. Amy, can uh, I just add something? So please. I think the event is really great because it's an opportunity for um, it could be mainly it could be parents or whoever the primary caregiver is so grandparents whoever wants to come with their child and so it'll be an education around just what does socio-emotional development look like with young children um, what are some things that might be helpful in terms of strategies so they're also going to get that information along with seeing how to um, do storybook reading and why that can be helpful for children as well um, and then as Amy said you'll get an, um, an activity so I think it's just, it's a great opportunity to come and learn some information, but also interact and with other caregivers who would be there as well. And I think teachers are welcome to come as well. So if they want to come and observe the process, we welcome them to attend the event. And these will be available at no cost also, um, which mm -hmm. is great. So if anybody has questions, oops. 
Um, we'd be happy to take them now, and then we also will share um, information on how to get in touch with us, how to access our website um, for more information on Read for Resilience or um, more resources um, that Linda talked about for helping with chat. All right, anybody have any questions um, about what um, Amy and Holly and Linda have shared today? Um, any questions you have about the program? Any uh, thoughts about having it in your libraries? I know we have people from a bunch of different libraries here. Um, on, the, on the show this morning. Um, everyone from Nebraska, just so you guys know. <laughs> um, it's all, um, at, at the moment, all Nebraska people. Um, I do know that we do get a lot of people from everywhere watch our recordings afterwards. So it's good to have that information in here in the recording um, for later in the archive for anyone who comes across it from um, outside of the state. So they'll have all that info. But as Linda mentioned earlier, that we have um, learning child edu educators throughout the state. Um, so if you're already partnering with some educators in your area, then you can reach out to them um, and they can provide information on um, how to access the program or how to get the program in your area. Um, but that is how we're, although Holly and I are housed in, in Lincoln and Linda's closer to Omaha, um, we do have resources available to, to get this program throughout the state. Um, so we throughout, throughout the that. Nebraska Extension is all across the state. Yeah. Now, is there, um, this is a question, is, is um, other states have similar thing, their own extension offices? That Because you, you said you had been in talking with other people in like South Dakota and Iowa. Is it the same um, group extension or is it other types of organizations or? Um, both. So extension is something that's uh, um, provided from land grant universities. There's one in every state. Um, so for South Dakota, we're partnering um, with Extension in South Dakota. Um, Iowa, it's the, the program um, that's shown interest and we're partnering with is not directly related through Extension, um, but connects and does a lot of work with Extension. Um, so we're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. um, and we are working on getting this, this program out. Um, so children who were impacted, um, not only by flooding, um, I mean, it started as, as a program specifically for natural disaster, but the books are broad enough um, that children who have been through any stressful event um, can benefit from them. Yeah, for, so for example, um, my uh, county and home library where I go to is in Bellevue, right? So mm -hmm. we, Bellevue um, is a pretty traditional military town. So our books are also a way too, so that if parents um, are deploying or they're on separation for a few weeks, you know, doing um, training or things like that, these books would certainly be appropriate um, for helping young children to sort of uh, cope with some of the feelings when it comes to separation from, you know, their primary caregiver. So Absolutely. those stories guides would be super appropriate. And as we mentioned, you know, we're still identifying other books because what really started um, was in a, in a real genuine response to what we were seeing in our communities. We're now um, hearing, well, this has been really helpful. Do you also have a resource for this one? Do you also have a resource for this? Yeah. Um, so so we're, we're continuing to think about then um, broadly, as Holly mentioned, how can we promote resiliency with young children using mm -hmm. effective literature? Yeah. Um, and that's a good um, tip. I was just thinking about that. You mentioned you know being by the military, um, by the bases. That's maybe something for other people in other states to um, reach out to. Is there someone in, if you are near a military base of some sort, reach out to them and see if they do have this kind of a need with the families um, and connect with them as a partnership that can then use these, the Read for Resilience um, guides and books and everything to, to help those kids. They might not even know if that's something that they should be dealing with, have to deal with, have an issue, you know, have a problem with that. They have, you know, we know from the libraries because of this, that we can now reach out to them as, as a uh, place that might need need our help. Yep. Yep, and extension educators are well connected. So if you're not sure where to start, you can reach out to our team and we'll put you in contact with someone in your area um, or someone close to your area who can help. Mm -hmm. I think this is good timing too. I mean, we had the flooding, you know, throughout the Midwest and, and the country earlier this year, but um, myself being, well, in Nebraska, of course, but also being from um, originally from upstate New York, uh, winter is coming, winter weather, and that can be devastating storms and things are just getting worse um, due to climate change. So the, the nor'easters that would come up the coast and just knock out our power and bury us in like two to three feet of snow for three days. <laughs> um, 
and I remember living through that as a child. And it's it's you know to a child you think it's oh it's fun because you know we're gonna go out and play in the snow all day, but it's also stressful because there's mm -hmm. the hours out there's no heat there's no light. Why is mom and dad worried about things? You know why are they not going to work or are they going to work out in this feet and feet of snow? So that season coming up, I think this would be something very useful in those um, areas as well. Mm -hmm. Something else you just made me think of, I think that these storybook reading guides, the Read for Resilience project can be helpful for, is it also can help you as the caregiver be thinking about your own emotions, you know, and feelings and thoughts. So even though they're children's books, they're great ways. Like I think, Linda, you brought up the, the one of color, right? So what, there's another one that we have, which is what color do you feel today, right? And so it's like, I might feel blue, I might feel pink, I might feel all gray, blue, and pink. So it's kind of a way to have common language and also, also for you to think about and process your own feelings with while you're reading the, the book with children too. So it's a really yeah. great parallel process that way. With adults, we've got so many other things we're trying to just deal with in these disaster situations. Having something simpler to read to help me get through it emotionally might be easier than an article in a, in a, in a, you know, in a, you know, a medical journal or in a newspaper that's this long and in-depth thing about how to take care of yourself. You know what, just give me something simple. I already have all these other things I'm dealing with that are huge. Something quick and simple that will just calm me down might be the way to go, yeah. Yeah, and you can even, like the picture, right? You can draw, what are my worries? Well, your child's drawing their worries, or as a child care provider, I'll draw my worries too. So it's really great when you can do the activities with the children. Yeah, as well. that, you know, journaling, writing in a diary, the artistic things that get, get the emotions out, absolutely. All right, so does anybody have any other questions? Anything else they wanna ask or suggestions or thoughts on on this? Do you guys want to show off the website now? You said you're going to do that. So our email for Read for Resilience is there. And then from the child.unl.edu website, you can um, access resources about um, for multiple things. Um, but that's the easiest way also to connect to the Read for Resilience website. Mm -hmm. Do you want to show that? Or you, um, you can show that on your screen if you want me to, or? Yeah. yeah. If, do you, if you'd like to pull it up, Krista, go right ahead. Okay, I can switch over to mine. Because um, I do have here. Yeah, I've got a pull presenter control to my screen. And here is, all right, so this is the um, session page for today's show, where you see we do have links to um, the, the website, the Read for Resilience program itself, but then the specific, what you have there, child unl.edu and then you'll see reading as one of the main tabs there so as long as you get to this page you'll be able to find it so both of the resources that we shared today the main disaster response website right and resources in general and then if you scroll down a little bit you'll see the other one reading I'm interested in storybooks right there so either, as long as you make it to child.unl.edu, it will get you to either of the resources that we talked about today. And then here's the different, each of the books that you guys have been working with so far. And then up here, it had the storybook guides that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So you can download the storybook guides, um, or, and then there's another option also to request the books. Okay. And you just collect some information about what they're um, some just a few quick questions to fill in. Not too bad, yeah. Yep. And then after after that information, um, it takes you right to the to the link to download the guides. We're just trying to get a sense of how people are using the books, whether they're finding them helpful, um, ways that we can improve the program. And then this is you said in Nebraska, that's what the request books would be. Mm -hmm. for? Yes. Okay. So there's a question um, asking about if you were affected by the natural disasters, what county in Nebraska you live in, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And then from there, um, okay. you can select five of the books and um, usually within about two, three weeks, they're delivered to your door. Do you get, well, I, I don't remember, do you get multiple copies or just one of each? Uh, one copy um, up to five of the books. 
And some of these may be things you may already have in your library's collection just because anyways, yeah. Yeah, Wimberly Worried is a is a popular one. Out ladies too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And some of the other ones are a little bit um, not, I guess, common to have, so like Bubble Trouble, but it's mm -hmm. a fun book. So we um, like we said, you can if you want that book, then you fill out the application and you can have it mm -hmm. directly mailed to you. This is a good way too, if it's a book you've not purchased for your library yet, this is a way to at least be able to take a look at it and see is it something you might want more copies of potentially. If it mm -hmm. is something very useful to some of your some of your children or families. Great. And we have two more that we'll be adding, so <laughs> yeah. All right. Anything else you want me to show on the website to people while we're here? I think that's our main main focus is that read for resilience and then the the uh, disaster response page also is the one that Linda. That is where you're talking about the beginning. Yeah, I saw that here, the um, helping children cope, the family stress section. Yep. The other emergency preparedness. Yep. That's where all this is. All right. So does anybody have any last minute questions you want to ask? Anything else you want to ask or anything you want to share about if uh, you may be using this in your library? Uh, type it in the question section. Um, this was great. I'm so glad we, you guys contacted me about putting this on the show because um, it's been a, you know, children dealing with disasters, trauma is, is always an issue, but especially what's been going on in the Midwest uh, this but this year it's been it's been a little extreme over the top <laughs> more than usual for everyone to deal with yeah we're hoping that this is a resource to to help children and adults connect and kind of process together I think it'll be very helpful yeah and we're going to share it out when we get our recordings and everything ready there um, for everybody um, to learn more about it Absolutely. All right, doesn't look like anybody has any desperate last minute questions they want to ask. That's fine. So I think we'll officially wrap it up for today. Thank you so much, uh, Amy, Linda, and Holly, for being with us here today. Um, yes. We, we um, are recording the show, so that will wrap it up for today. And I'm going to get back to our site. There we go. Um, so we are recording, and the recording will be available on our main Encompass Live page here. Um, so far in the world, you can Google Encompass Live, the name of the show, and nothing else is called that yet on the internet. Nobody else is allowed to use this name. <laughs> um, if you bring it, yeah, search for it, you'll find our website um, and our archives. Uh, this is our upcoming shows, but right underneath all of our list of upcoming shows is the link to our archives. Uh, these are in um, the most recent one is the top of the list. So this is the one from last week. Uh, the recording will be, as I said earlier, um, it will be posted to the Library Commission's YouTube channel. And then I think you guys were going to send me your slides to, to add. Yeah. Yep, we'll have a link to the slides as well if you want to look at them too. Um, it will be based on this and it will also have a link to the website because that's part of the session description for today's show. Um, when it is and the recording is available here and ready, I will send an email out to everyone who attended today and everyone who registered for today's show. Uh, we also push it out on our various social media. We have Twitter that we use for um, Encompass Live. Um, we have a Facebook page, so we'll put it all out there as well. Um, and while I'm showing you the archives here, I'll show you we do have a search feature here where you can search through all our previous shows, where you can search the entire archives or the most recent 12 months only if you want to. Um, this is because Encompass Live has been around for about 10 years. Our first show was January 2009. So we have a, and we have the full history of the show here. So this is a, a very, very long page, uh, going back to the very beginning. So um, we did put in a search feature so you can narrow down, search for a specific topic or also just search for something recent if you want really up-to-date information. Um, because this does have our full archive in here, you will find old shows that maybe are um, outdated, the product or service doesn't exist anymore or has changed since we talked about it. Um, links might be broken or you're gonna have to find a new one. Um, but just pay attention to the date. Everything has a date of when it was originally broadcast. So um, if it is an old one, just make you realize that you're you know watching something older. Um, some of our shows are, you know, stand the test of time, no problems, you know, reading, uh, 
books, lists of books to read, kids books, teen books, whatever, but sometimes certain things may um, become outdated. So just pay attention when you are watching a show um, and doing your searches on here. Um, we are librarians, we are libraries, so we do archive and historical things. So we'll always keep adding to this as long as we've got somewhere to, to host all of this. So as I said, we do have a Facebook page. I've got that open up over here. So if you are a big Facebook user, you can like us on Facebook. We post reminders about shows um, and announcements of things going on with um, Encompass Live. Here's a reminder to log into today's show. Um, if we scroll down here, uh, previous recording being available from last week. So um, two or three times a week, not too busy on the page. So if you do um, like to use Facebook, uh, give us a like over there. Um, or follow our hashtag on Twitter, NCUMP Live, a little abbreviation there. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's show. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, guys, for being here with me this morning. And I hope you join us next week when our topic is Pretty Sweet Tech, the power of the Internet. Uh, Pretty Sweet Tech is our monthly show being done by Amanda Sweet, our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, she started this up a few months ago, so um, now she's on to a regular schedule where the last Wednesday of every month will be her Pretty Sweet Tech show on a different topics each time. And this one next week is the power of the Internet, use it wisely. So you can learn all about um, how you can um, be a, a good user of the internet. So please do uh, sign up and join us for that show or any of our other upcoming shows coming up. We have the, um, all the rest of the AC year is booked. I'm still waiting on a couple of descriptions for the sessions in December, but the dates are filled in. Um, so keep an eye on that to see what we actually have coming up as our specific shows. So oh, thank you everybody for being here. I hope we'll see you on an, a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Thank you.